I remember at the time standing up in front of this congregation singing, Savior, he can move the mountains. Apparently everybody but mine. Like, I remember thinking he can move the mountains for whatever reason. He's not doing it right now in this situation. He can heal my husband and he's not doing it. I was broken. I was angry. I was all of it. And this record label saying, hey, we think you should write some worship songs. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? Laura Story is a Bible teacher, worship leader, best-selling author, and Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter, known for such hits as Blessings, Indescribable, and Mighty to Save. Blessings was certified gold in 2011 and inspired her first book, What If Your Blessings Come Through Raindrops? Laura's music and writing show God's love and grace intersecting with real life and serve as a reminder that despite questions or circumstances, he is the ultimate author of our story, as told in her second book, When God Doesn't Fix It. She has a master's degree in theological studies and a doctorate degree in worship studies. She is the worship leader at Atlanta's Perimeter Church, and her greatest joy is being a wife to Martin and mother to Josie, Ben, Griffin, and Timothy. This is Laura's Stories. Well, this is season one, episode one of Laura's Stories. This is your first podcast. It is. I can't believe it. Hello, I'm Beth Bacall. You are... Laura Stories. This is... <laughs> I mean, Laura's Story. Sorry. You have so many stories. Yeah, I'm just kind of a blabbermouth. I don't know. I, <laughs> you're so encouraging, though, that, to think that, that, that people want to hear my stories. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's pull them out of you. We are in a Perimeter Church, which is where you are, a yes, worship leader. I am. It is 100 degrees today in Atlanta, Georgia. I know. I've So I've been here in Atlanta. My husband and I moved here 15 years ago to work at Perimeter Church. And this is home for us. So I want to start at the very, 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 very beginning. And I want to start with some, oh, what was that? The side? very beginning. Now I'm getting scared. <laughs> and I feel like we should let them know how this works. I come in with coffee. You come in with all of the questions and I just get to be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> but your answers are all about you. I mean, this is, we were saying how you can't study for this. You can't get anything um, wrong because it's your life. We'll see about that. Okay. I'll figure out a way to get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What's a uh, place and warm word association? All right. What do you think about? What's the first thing that you think about when I say the word miles? Miles. Uh, wow. I think about recently the amount of miles I have put on my minivan going around talking about the new book. So I, I just read a book called I Give Up. And normally I think that like real professional musician people do radio tours in probably like tour buses but no not me I pile all of my children in the minivan and we just drive from station to station when I say from station to station we went up the east coast all the way to New Jersey and stopped in all of the radio stations <laughs> between here and New Jersey and then went over to Ohio and went down and so we've we visited about 25 stations so far and we have about 25 to go and as crazy as this sounds, I love it. I love it. And the kids seem to love it. They they think it's so neat to, to go and, uh, you know, wreck, I mean, visit all these different <laughs> stations, <laughs> dismantle all these different, you know, soundboards. <laughs> I'll tell you, the one thing that I have, that I have gotten, it's, it's just kind of a funny comment because, you know, a lot, it's not a, a new thing for, for artists to visit radio stations, but these stations, they say, wow, Laura, one thing we like about you is you, you just keep it real. And I'm going, okay, this is probably a little more real than you wanted. You know, everything from, uh, you know, changing diapers and <laughs> in these, these recording studios. And uh, yeah, we leave, we leave some real gifts behind as well when we... <laughs> well, actually, you had your kids pack all the snack mixes and the gifts for the oh, friends yeah. at the radio station before you even took these trips. Well, and that's something with, with the kids. I'm trying to explain to them what we do. Because for them, you know, it's sometimes it's just a big party on the road, which, you know, we get to go to hotels. We get to swim in pools at hotels. You know, they love all that that part of it. But one thing I wanted to do is... You know, usually as an artist, you know, saying thank you to the radio stations for partnering with with us in ministry. 
sometimes we'll you know do a little journal or something. But this time I wanted the kids to be able to be involved. So we made snack mix. And <laughs> when I say we made snack mix, I let each of the kids choose like their favorite thing to put in these little jars. And we made little stickers that, you know, uh, talked about, you know, thank you for partnering with us in ministry. And, and they... So we, they filled these jars with M&Ms, cranberries, goldfish, you know, a snack mix that you would not normally, you know, combine these <laughs> foods together. And I, I made all the kids wash their hands. No one sneezed in any of them. It was, uh, we were very careful with all of that. But it was neat for them to go and, and give something to these radio stations and to thank them. Because I keep on talking to my kids about it because people, they, they're so sweet to the kids. And a lot of times they'll show up and they, they will have bought them, you know, whether it's people at churches we visit, you know, buy, buy them coloring books, buy them presents. And I remember asking my kids once, okay, so when we travel around and play music, are we going to be served or to serve? And I remember like pulling out my Bible and reading the passage where it says, Jesus, you know, Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So when we come, do you think we're coming to serve or be served? And they're just kind of sitting there puzzled. And I remember Josie finally saying, well, I know I'm supposed to say serve, but it feels like every time we come to these places, we're being served. And I said, well, there's, there's that mutual blessing of, of us getting to, to meet people and and them really um, care for our family and show us appreciation but our heart should be to come and serve, you know, so telling, you know, one of the twins that he, <laughs> he'll walk right, we go to the church, he walks right in and goes, so what are we going to eat? Like this literally Benji every time. So do you have any food? Uh, and I said, Benji, you know, so I'll talk to him. Benji, that is, that is not going to be the first thing that comes out of your mouth. And so he started going in and say, hi, we are here to serve. Do you have any food? <laughs> <laughs> Benji, Benji's all about the food. He's always going to the gig for the food. I don't even remember what the question was that you started <laughs> out asking matter. me. Miles, yes, we've put a lot. Miles. We've put a lot of miles in our car and eaten a lot of snack mix and food at churches and, and, and the, radio stations. And the one thing every radio station needs is a place for the big wheels after the interviews and all the happening serving happens. Oh yeah, well, because you know, along with the miles thing. We were spending, you know, for this trip, probably between six and nine hours in the car each day. Wow. Which for little kids, after you show up to the hotel at 7.30, 8 o'clock, even though mom is, I'm exhausted from the driving, from the, you know, just travel in general. But these kids have so much energy. So we we pack uh, their, their big wheels, you know, if you've seen us Instagram videos or whatever, Facebook, uh, Josie brought her scooter. And so we will take them out in these parking lots. You know, I'm very safe about it, but, but usually we're staying in a hotel right next to some, you know, business with a huge parking lot that everyone has left for the day. So we'll just do laps and Timmy just kind of walks around and it's like, we got to run them. We got to get this energy out. And, and so, yeah, but we, we really do have a blast getting to do this. And, and Martin, my husband, Martin comes in, he'll meet us on the weekends. He'll meet us like when we have off days, he'll like, I'll come for those. (laughs) It's like, I'm going to skip the whole in the car for eight hours and eating at Taco Bell, every other meal. We're just going to, he said, I'm just going to come for the fun part. You are such a good mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brave I'm so mom. sorry. Let's, <laughs> if we could rewind that real quick. I just said, yeah, watching movies all day, eating at Taco Bell. And you just said, you're such a gr- letting my kids ride their scooters in parking lots. Oh, such a great mom. I'm, wond- I'm wondering if I need to make a disclaimer, like, please do not call Department of Social Services on me after no. this podcast. No, you're including <laughs> them. You're bringing them with you and you're giving them life lessons along the way. How many miles did you put on your odometer about? Oh, man. I don't know as far as amount of miles. I think we we did about 38 hours in the car, wow. though, um, and that was over 10 days. I was following you on Instagram, watching all the radio stops you were making, and I I reached out to your your management. I said, who's doing all the driving? (laughs) And Nicole, your manager, emails back, 
She is. I'm thinking about getting my, like, what is it? The C- C- CDL? Is that what it is? The truck? Like, if this music thing doesn't work out, I think I might be a trucker. <laughs> Partly because I really love driving. I love, and I love seeing, like, we drove through so many cornfields in Iowa or wherever we were. Uh, where, I don't even know where we were. The other thing I like, and this is like <laughs> true confessions, I love roller food. Like, I love going to Flying J and finding, like, Whatever they have rolling on the roller. You know what I'm talking about? You know what roller food is? Oh, yeah. I know the roller grill. Yeah. This is... um, Hot dogs, taquitos. This is not for the... (laughs) You guys are just shaking your head looking at me. Like, you've lost your mind. You're right. I am not this organic mom. I am not gluten-free. I take all the gluten that other people don't want. (laughs) The more gluten, the merrier. I am... uh, Yeah. So I think I'd be a really good trucker. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where all the kids would go, but I could do it. You'll figure if it out. If the music thing doesn't work out, I'm trucking. <laughs> you know, uh, you have to sleep in your truck when you're trucking. Yeah, we, we've got little sleep compartments. I'm all about it. So one of our, so we have the minivan, you know, the regular minivan, and then we have a Sprinter van that we use for other trips, and we have five bunks in the back of the Sprinter van. Sprinter van that I also drive because I, well, and this part this is partly about me being a control freak. This isn't okay. just me being like this servant's heart. But you know, you mentioned about the the kids and them, uh, you know, learning so much on this. One of the cool things about it, if you were to ask my kids right, if they were standing here right now, and ask them, why do you guys go out and do what you do? Why do why do you go with mommy and play music? Why do y'all go to the different places? They would tell you. To show people God loves them and to tell people God loves them. Every time I ask them, and, and I think that we have them so conditioned to, uh, to know what the mission is. Because I don't want to just drag them along. And, and they really, they love it. There's parts that, you know, there's times that's hard work. We had a part of this trip that it was like a two or three day trip that just Josie and I did. And we were visiting some radio stations in Texas and we... Our flight was delayed, and we landed around midnight, and there was no gate, so we sat there for 45 minutes and waited for the gate to open up. We finally got a gate. We went to the rental car place, and there was they'd given our car away because we were so late, and then we finally they finally found us this pickup truck that did not have power steering, and so we get to the hotel, and they had given our hotel room, because it was at 1.30 at this point in time. And Josie, <laughs> she was like, I thought this was going to be fun. I, you know, I don't, I don't know what she was expecting. But I told her, I said, sometimes this is really hard work, but it's still worth it. And we get to go and encourage some people that work at a radio station tomorrow. And we don't do it because it's fun. We do it because we believe that, that God is worthy of us giving him our time. And, and we believe that th- this, is just, this is just part of what we do. This is part of what God's called us to. Now can I say you're a good mom? Well, I don't know. Could I please? We'll see. (laughs) Joy, 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 joy down in your joy. Oh, joy. You know, our story does involve a lot of heartache, you know, with my husband's brain tumor, with the disabilities that he he has. Um, But nonetheless, our story involves a lot of joy. I have a wonderful husband who... Golly, Martin, from a very young age, like if you were to ask his parents, they would tell you that he has always been a very joyful kid. And he's like, he still is kind of a big joyful kid. <laughs> he's, he is, um, he loves having fun. He loves joking around. And so there's always been joy there. And so the, the bigger challenge is how do we allow, how do we not allow our circumstances to rob him and I of that joy and we've always you know we we knew each other since we were in high school and so we've just always loved having fun and you know we're really goofy around our house and and our kids have kind of picked up on that and so all this to say in spite of aspects of our life looking different than what we expected and there are hard parts of our life but that doesn't mean that we can't still both experience joy and choose joy. 
I, I really think that my kids, when, when we grow up and they look back on, on our family and our, on our life, you know, especially their childhood, I think that more than what happened to us, more than what we did as a family, I think that they will remember how we responded to what happened to us. I, we were sitting around once, I think it was one Thanksgiving a few years ago, and we were talking, it was me and him and his parents and his brothers and talking about some memories, some of their favorite memories of their, their childhood. And Martin said, man, one of my favorite memories was that time that our family got a paper route. Okay. So Martin was in elementary school. He said, yeah, we were getting up early in the morning and, and we'd have to wrap the papers and then we'd go out before school and deliver the papers throughout the neighborhood. And Martin is telling this story as if it was one of the brightest moments of his childhood. And, and I'm looking at the faces of everyone else that's sitting there, and they all look kind of puzzled because, you know, as they begin to, and I, that's the only version of this that I'd ever heard was, oh, we decided to get a paper route, and it was so much fun. But his parents said, yeah, that was the time that we were really struggling financially. Mm. And, uh, you know, dad was between jobs, and, and there, we did this in order to get some extra income but that story, it has so impacted me because I realize as a parent, I have not just the responsibility, but the ability to really completely change how my children remember an event, how they experience something in our life that really could be catastrophic, but based on how I respond to it based on how I model joy to them in the midst of it, they might actually walk away thinking, oh, that was one of the highlights of my childhood. When was the very first time you laid eyes on Martin? When was the first meeting? Yes, the first meeting. <laughs> That's a kind of a funny story anyway. I was attending an FCA cookout with a friend of mine, so Fellowship of Christian Athletes, which I do not have an athletic bone in my body, but I had a good friend who played volleyball at our high school, and she invited me to come to this FCA event, and I thought, uh, I don't know, like, because I, I was just envisioning all these athletes uh, inviting me to make fun of me as a musician, <laughs> as as a member of the Dorchestra, as Martin's fin friends affectionately called it. But I, I went, and that's where we met, and I... I will never forget, I was wearing this really baggy pair of overalls. They were tan, and they had water buffaloes on them, like little, <laughs> this is a, like tiny little water, you know, tiny little water buffaloes. And here's the other hilarious part about it. At the time, Martin and I had the same haircut. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> oh. And so I was in... I was there with my with my fancy water buffalo overalls, my nicest pair of Birkenstocks, and my complete boy haircut. Oh man! You can tell that not only uh, did I stick out because I wasn't an athlete and my physique proved it, you know, but I def I just stuck out because I just was a weirdo. <laughs> and it was a couple of days later when a friend of mine said, "Hey." do you know who Martin Elvington is? And I'm thinking, oh, that's that really hot baseball player from the, from the FCA cookout. Because <laughs> clearly, when you're a musician, you're going to an FCA cookout because you want a fellowship with a good-looking Christian athlete. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know who he is. And they said, well, he's wanting your number. And I'm thinking, why would he want my number? First of all, I know who he is. He doesn't know who I am. They said, yeah, he, he asked for your number. And I, I really thought, huh. Why would he have, I was completely perplexed why he would have asked for, for my number. And sure enough, he calls me, you know, this is before texting. This is, um, you know, called me on the landline at my house and asked if I wanted to, to go out that weekend. And I remember we went, he picked me up in his uh, super old uh, Monte Carlo, this white Monte Carlo that was just like the first car ever it was old as dirt and him picking me up and we went to Applebee's because it was the nicest restaurant in Spartanburg and I was like wow he's taking me to Applebee's <laughs> I'm 
might get like some baby back ribs. It's like it was, <laughs> it was a really special moment. And I still was was fairly confused. And I think that halfway through, I was like, yeah, I think this is a date. I think because I really had not dated very mm. much. Uh, I dated a couple guys in the orchestra. <laughs> just kind of really, um, just really wasn't very good at dating. And so at, I remember at the end of the night, um, him saying, I really, I really like you. I'd like to go out again. I was like, I, yeah, sure. Yes. You are very good looking. And I, I would like to go out with you. <laughs> and then he, he let me wear his letter jacket. And I was like, whoa. That night? This doesn't really fit. But yeah, I think, yeah, I remember that night. Um, yep. I don't think he, I don't think it was like a thing. It was uh, like, I think I was cold. And so I got to put on his letter jacket and I was like, look at me. Here I am wearing a boy's letter jacket. Wow. <laughs> Sounds like happy days or something. I don't know. <laughs> it was it's kind of a surreal experience. But so that was the beginning and, and we you know, we had just like typical high school sweet romance, you know, I love you, I hate you, I love you know. Mm. And he was he always gave me cards all the time. And I remember him putting cards like under my windshield wiper and I'd um come out of school and there'd be this sweet card from Martin. And that still is his love language. What did he say when he called you on the phone? Do you remember you were at your house and he calls you? I he was I remember him saying, Hey, this is this is Martin Elvington. Now do you remember me from the party? And I was like, Oh yeah. Sure. I was I was so breezy. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> You're like the best looking guy there. Of course I remember you from the party. But I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I think I remember which one you were. <laughs> it was nothing dumb like that. Oh, I remember the other thing was that it was, uh, the next day was my birthday. And so I, I went out with him September 4th, 1994 a long time ago September 4th 1994 and we were out and he was and somehow it came up that it was my birthday that weekend you know the next the next day and he was like I can't believe that you would want to go out with me you know your birthday weekend and I was like well yeah you know I had a lot of other stuff going on but (laughs) I made some time you know I don't know what I said but he just he's always been such a a gracious person um, shown a lot of just he's just always been sweet and uh, um, even even then he I don't know he just was, we had a lot of fun together in high school and and being uh, high school sweethearts w- we didn't have money because we were <laughs> teenagers and so we went out sometimes but normally we would just go to each other's house for dinner and then watch TV with each other's parents so even when we ended up getting married, like 10 years later, we knew each other's families so well. Like, I remember um, him coming up, you know, my parents would go to the lake and he would come and, and water ski with us and stuff. And I remember going to his brother's baseball games and things like that. And, and we just, we were just good. F- it was like we were good friends mm. more than, than boyfriend and girlfriend. Mm. We just got along really mm. well. Really comfortable. Yes. So we both grew up in the church. And I, I became a Christian when I was 10 years old and Martin grew up in a, in a church that talked, talked a lot about religion and Martin probably would have told you that he was a Christian in high school. But when I went off to college and I met so many, um, you know, girls and guys who were living for their faith and, and church wasn't just something that they went to and God wasn't just part of their life. He was the very core of their life. I began to grow in my faith in such a substantial way that I think it was a little bit confusing um, for Martin and I because he wasn't growing in that same way. And we ended up breaking up and and still remained friends. It just wasn't working out. But I remember about a year later, he called me and said, Laura, I got to, I got to tell you something. I just became a Christian, like for real. He said, I, I see that it has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with Jesus and his death on the cross, paying for my sins. And, and the way that he talked about 
God from then on was just like he had a personal relationship with God. And it, and at that point, it wasn't like, oh, yay, Martin's a Christian. We should start dating again. There was it wasn't any even any thought of that because we just were friends that would share, you know, kind of what we were learning from the scriptures. We just were you know, we we talked probably every six to nine months. And when I came through town, we'd get together. And and I remember, you know, him telling me about girls that he was going out with or I'd be dating someone. And, and it was always just a, oh, it's Martin. You know, we dated in high school and still good friends. And so it wasn't until much later that, um, you know, when we got reconnected, I, we initially, you know, as soon as we started spending time together, it was, hey, this is the Martin that I had so much fun with in high school and, we, and that we've always been so compatible and, and the things that we like to do with our free time and all of that. But he was also this man of God. I could tell that he had a true relationship with the Lord and he had grown so much spiritually over those you know, six, seven years. It was it was so neat to see and I just fell in love all over again. Wow, and it's neat to hear and for us to hear part of the story to see how God laid that entire foundation for you. Absolutely. Wow. So we were high school sweethearts and friends for a long time and then got married and within the first two years of our marriage noticed just some health things with Martin, which at the time we had no idea how involved um, the issues were. But at the time, it was just he was tired, and there were a few small things he was forgetting. And so after maybe six to nine months of us trying to figure out what was going on and him seeing counselors and things, we found out that he had a brain tumor. And that was uh, certainly you know, jarring in your first couple years of marriage and had to go through surgery to have the tumor removed and then had some complications and ended up um, in the hospital for about three months. And we finally, he was discharged at the end of three months and uh, we set out to kind of figure out what life was going to look like after that because what we knew right off the bat was that things were going to be very different than what we expected. Your song, Blessings, is one of the biggest things you're known for. And the song, Blessings, came out of this trial journey, life journey with Martin. Start with everything. Every, I want to know everything about Blessings. <laughs> where, where the idea came from. How you finally said, I'm just going to get this on paper. How, where, where did it come from? How did it get to where, where, it's at, where we're at with it right now? Yes, so... The song Blessings, so at the time I had done one one record with uh, the group Fair Trade, which is the fantastic record label that I'm with, and that, um, can I tell you that story too? Yeah. Because one, one of the neat things about, I, I had been writing songs and had not re- recorded a lot, but just a little bit, and this group... Uh, Fair Trade had reached out to me about the possibility of being part of their, of their record label. Where were you as an artist when all of this was happening with so, yeah. Martin? So I, I had just um, so I had just written the song Indescribable, and Chris Tomlin had recorded it, and so that was <laughs> that's a whole other podcast too. Yeah. I cannot wait to hear that story. This is why your podcast is called Your uh, Stories. Yes, I do have a few stories, but so I was. We had just taken a job at Perimeter Church and had moved here. Martin was starting graduate school. So I was reached out to from from this record label and got a phone call from them. And they told me they were interested in me being part of of their team and, and recording, writing some songs, recording them. And I was, you know very humbled that they were even considering me and and really excited about it. And they were going to drive down to Atlanta to meet me, to come to one of the church services here. And two days before they were supposed to come, Martin went to that doctor's appointment and what we thought, we thought he might have mono or something. You know, it was, there was nothing, no headaches, nothing to indicate brain tumor. So we got the news, and so I immediately called this record label and said, hey, this, um, you know, I can't do this right now. Basically, we have this this health thing with my husband, very unexpected, 
And they said, well, we, we'd still love to come down and have dinner with you. And so they did that, met them, wonderful people. I thought, man, you guys are great. You know, And they said, well, we'll pray for you during the midst of it. So probably three months later, they checked back in and said, hey, um, we want you to know that we're still here. And I said, okay, thanks. And six months later, they checked back in and nine months later. And, and then about a year later, they approached me again and they said, we still want to partner with you, you know, writing songs, recording songs. And at first I was a little bit baffled because I said, okay, look at my life. And at this point in time, it was be- becoming very obvious that, that things were far more broken than we realized. Mm-hmm. And where we had initially thought, okay, Martin had a brain, has a brain tumor. He's going to have it removed. We're going to get back to the plan. We're going to get on with our lives. We were realizing that he had some pretty substantial brain damage. And we were sorting through what that really meant. And it wasn't just on a logistic level. It was spiritually. (laughs) I was beginning to realize that I was really good at trusting God when I agreed with his plan. (laughs) And so we were kind of in a fight. (laughs) And it was just tough when you're serving as a worship leader. And I remember at the time standing up in front of this congregation singing, Savior, he can move the mountains. Apparently everybody but mine. Like I remember thinking he can move the mountains. For whatever reason, he's not doing it right now in this situation. He can heal my husband, and he's not doing it. And I I was broken. I was angry. I was all of it. And this record label saying, hey, we think you should write some worship songs. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's a terrible idea because I am, I am so bankrupt before the Lord right mm. now that you do not want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> And finally, I remember one of the guys named James saying, no, Laura, that's it. We do. We do want, we need songs where people are choosing to worship and people are choosing to trust God in the midst of the brokenness. We need songs written by people, not that have experienced this aha healing moment. There's a tidy bow on their story. We need people who are still in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the brokenness, showing us that God can be worshipped and should be worshipped even in the midst of the trial. And I thought, well, I don't know if I'm the girl to do that. And they said, well, just just try. Just try to write some songs in your season right now. So that went on uh, for a couple of years, just praying that God would give me songs. And I did an album that really was that. It was The album was called Great God Who Saves. And the title track of that, there's a song basically straight from the Psalms, because I don't know if you knew this or not, but David writes a lot about how to worship God in the midst of the trial. And Great God Who Saves, the title title track says, I would have despaired if I had not believed. Basically that I would see the goodness of the Lord, because he is, he is a God who saves, and he may not be saving the way that I think he should right now, but he was saving me. He wasn't fixing everything, but he was still saving me. So that's the very long backstory of of all of this. So I had done a record with them called Great God Who Saves, and then we were going into the second record, and things were going great at the church. Martin and I, we we were to a point where his health was stable, and things were actually going pretty well with us. One of the issues that we really longed for children, and we can we can talk. We'll probably talk more about that in a different one that we can talk more about infertility and miscarriages, all of that, because that's a big part of our story. But with all of that happening, I think I kind of thought it'd be a good time to wrap up this whole recording, traveling musician thing, because I love my job at the church. I I think I just want to be a worship leader at Perimeter and a mom. So as I was finishing up this album we had one more space and (laughs) we'd also run out of money and so we needed one more song that was just a small song when I say a small song I mean 
that we don't have to pay anyone else to play on it. <laughs> and so, so there's me playing piano and singing. So we were just find a song that I can just play piano and sing to. And I was r- driving and it was my, my husband was sitting, Martin was sitting in the passenger seat and I was driving because at this point in time, we were about five years out and because of Martin's vision, I'm the driver. And as we were driving, it was probably 11, 12 o'clock at night, driving on I-20 through Birmingham, Alabama. We were heading to some some church that we were doing an event at the next day. And it was just that moment. I was reflecting. I remember looking next to me at Martin asleep. And I remember first just thinking about how thankful I was that he was alive. And I remember God just reminding me of of the ways he had been so faithful to us over those five years. And I realized I had this a little bit of an epiphany as I was thinking about, you know, we had so fervently prayed for God to heal Martin. And so many people had been praying for it. Our church had been praying for it. And we, and we still, I say this, uh, we still have not stopped praying for healing for Martin. I still believe that God could do it with the snap of a finger. But in that moment, I was reflecting on the fact that even though God had not done the thing that I had asked him for over and over again, I realized that there were still dozens, if not hundreds of other things that he had done for us. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of other ways that he had been at work through this broken thing that we were living in. And that's kind of how how the idea came about. And I remember my car thinking, what if (laughs) that chorus is just a bunch of questions? Those were my real (laughs) questions. It was, I'm just sitting there thinking, what if your blessings actually come through the raindrops? And what if the healing actually comes through the tears? And what if it's those thousand sleepless nights, whether that's us in the hospital, whether that's um, <laughs> me me being the one driving rather than the one sleeping in the car that, that evening? What if it's the thousand sleepless nights that those are the moments when everyone else is gone and you feel so alone? What if that's the moment that God shows you, you are not, I am here. And that was the beginning of me realizing that this thing we were walking through was so much bigger than whether Martin is healed or not. And honestly, I could not have possibly understood the scope of writing that song in that moment. Because after I wrote that song, (laughs) you know, jokes on me, my career wasn't, that wasn't like the last little song I was going to put on that album. And okay, now I'm done. And now I can, you know, have a baby and serve at the church. The cool thing is I, is God, man, he knew, he knew that, that those, that first year of Josie's life, we would be out doing ministry together, telling this story and singing the song blessings. And it was far greater than anything I had in store for that first year of her life. Um, But the more we shared, the more we sang and the more stories that came back to us of how God, how God has used that song in ways that we could have never imagined it has been healing for us. Do you, do you remember the first time you played it in front of other people? Yes. I do. Yeah. <laughs> and it, that's the funniest part. is I had never played it in front of people before it was on the radio. <laughs> so, it, you know, most people, like, you'll play some songs for a while and they'll go, oh, that's really good. Oh, I should record that. So this, I played it in the studio and then we turned in the record and then the guys at the label were like hey have you heard this last song that it's just laura just singing on piano have you you heard this and then they thought golly this is and and kind of in radio world um usually the most expensive one goes to (laughs) like they send that one to the radio station usually it has like some big choir and a lot of people like a big band you know 
it sound, sounds really shiny. <laughs> this was just really plain. And they said, for whatever reason, we feel like we need to send this song to the radio stations. And so the first thing that happened, golly, I can't even talk about this without, without weeping. I remember uh, one of the program directors from a station in Houston saying that he had gone, he was at the gym, and kind of his routine was he would download all the new songs onto his iPod, you know, that was the thing at the time, on his iPod and go work out. And he told me that he was working out, you know, to Newsboys, Mercy, you know, whoever, and then all of a sudden this little piano song came on with this little girl singing. And he just sat down on the bench and cried. <laughs> I picture this this man at the gym, everyone else around him working out, and he just sits on the bench and starts crying. And he said he just, that's when he knew it was a special song. And so at first that started happening with the program directors at these stations. And then, strangely enough, people started playing the song. And I'll never forget going to... Uh, radio station in Washington, D.C., and sitting down in front of the keyboard and looking out and seeing hundreds of people. Because before, <laughs> before Blessings, I would play for a strong crowd of like a few dozen, which, which I, you know, and it's really, for me, it's not about how many people I play for. It, it really is just anyone that's willing to listen. But all of a sudden, I'm looking at all these people realizing I've never played this song before. Man, I sure hope they like it. And sitting down and telling a little bit about the story, crying, <laughs> because this is the first time I'd really talked about it in front of people. And then I played the song, and then they stood up and clapped. And it wasn't, it wasn't just that they were standing up and clapping for a song. They were applauding that Romans 8 28 really is true that he really does work all things together for his good and everything that I had written about in that song that was these what if questions God was using that standing ovation to say yes this is true I am at work I love taking the most broken things and making something beautiful and that was the beginning of the radio stations playing it of people emailing me the most amazing stories of God meeting them through that song. And that was such an important part of our healing, of seeing, yeah, God is doing it, not just in our lives, but in the lives of others. I posted on Facebook, I asked the question, how has Laura's story song Blessings made a difference in your life? And these are just a few of the responses. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. My niece sang this at my wedding. Not a typical wedding song, but it meant a lot to us because we both went through a lot to find each other. We pray for healing, for prosperity. This is from a girl named Candace. After having a miscarriage, I learned that I had cancer. I'm now healed from cancer, but this song was a wonderful reminder that his ways are best. And if I didn't have the miscarriage, I would not have found out about the cancer. Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? This is from Linda beautiful song. It reminds me of 2006 when I lost four of the closest people in my life within six months. It totally wiped me emotionally and spiritually, but I truly learned God's mercy, His love, and His promises. All your mercies in disguise. This is from Jean. She says, my Sunday school teacher, Buddy, was shot point blank while on duty as a county police officer. This song was sung one Sunday not long after his death. There weren't quite as many tears that day as the Sunday of his funeral, but there were still a good many shed. I think of him every time I hear this song. The pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not a home. This is from 
Sarah Beth. She said, the song Blessings is a huge blessing. I've always wondered, how do you really know you're going to heaven? I've always believed, and I believe Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross, and three days later he rose to save the world. I've asked God to come into my heart and save me. Finding out my dad has cancer, and in the midst of a storm, I was able to feel God's loving arms around me and his presence. That gave me the confirmation I needed to know that when I die, I will go to heaven. I now know that I am saved. And when I feel connected to him, I feel his presence. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> wow. First time I met you and Martin, I asked if you would autograph a box of Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten that. I feel like we could oh. use a few right now. <laughs> yeah. Should have brought that box. <laughs> At the taping of this podcast, you're coming off a summer filled with a lot of miles covered by you on a tour for your book, for your latest Bible study, for your new music, and you've been interviewed a lot. You've been asked a lot of questions, but I want to end this first podcast, first Laura's Stories podcast, by asking you, what do you want to be asked? Out of all of the interview questions, out of everything people have been trying to pull out of you and find out about you, even just within this last summer, what is it that you want to be asked? In First Peter, uh, he talks about always be ready to give an answer for those who ask about the hope within you. If anyone was to ask me a question, I would want them to ask me about the hope. Partly because... I see a lot of people out there who need hope, who are going through very hard things and really just hanging on by a thread. But the main reason I want people to ask me about the hope within me, because that's the best part of me. <laughs> I am such a mess. But God is holding me together in a way that it really testifies to the fact that he's, he truly is. He's more than just a creator. He's a sustainer. It's, it's true what the scriptures say, that he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. So if, if people are going through a hard time where they feel hopeless, I want them to remember it's just the middle of the story. It's just the middle of the story. It's just the valley, and it's not the ending. And just because you can't understand how he's working, it doesn't mean that he is any less present in your life. Think about what the Bible tells us. It doesn't say if you walk through the fire or if you pass through the water. It says when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. When you pass through the waters, I am with you. And just this constant reminder that he is always there and he is always at work. And that is our hope. I feel like we so often try to find hope in God changing our circumstances when the call of Scripture is to find hope in God and believe He is enough to sustain us even on the hardest of days. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are worse? That wraps up this episode of Laura's Stories. So subscribe to Laura's Stories. And if you could be so kind, leave a review on iTunes too. She and her friends Beth Bacall, Super Producer David A. Dean, and Super Manager Nicole Owens have more stories on the way.